All right, guys, welcome back to The Smiley Show. Um, we have a guest here that is a rookie on the PGA Tour coming off of the Corn Ferry Tour. Jake Knapp, the long-hitting PGA Tour player, just had a great finish at the Farmers Insurance Open and cashed in pretty nice. And Jake, have you spent all the money yet, or what, what's the deal? Have we, have we bought anything cool? No, nothing uh, nothing too exciting, that's for sure. Um, got my brother <laughs> a birthday present last night, and then that was, uh, that was about it so far. And going to do my best to save it the best I can. Did I read right? Was it $474,000? Uh, yeah, 477, I think it is. 477. I, I, I cheated him $3,000. I mean, that's got to be a pretty <laughs> dang cool text to get, right? Yeah. Yeah. Very, uh, very surreal. I mean, even, even last year on, on, uh, uh, corn Ferry, like I think it was the final check of the year, or maybe, maybe in, uh, I think it was Ohio state was like my biggest biggest check ever received or you know the largest text ever received from the pga tour and i was like man that's just a what was a lot of money uh i can't remember exactly i want to say maybe somewhere around 60 70 grand something like that but i had a similar text uh i think it was because i won on the corn ferry like one of the first couple weeks that i played but then i don't know later in the year I, i finished second at springfield and i got a text for like finishing second for like 72 grand or something like that and i was like holy crap like i don't know why it didn't hit me the first time but like the second place and making that much money on the corn ferry i was like oh this is sick <laughs> oh yeah i mean I, I i still i crack up about it because when i finished i played uh like my first taste of professional golf at the pj tour event was the rbc in in 2019 and i was able to squeak by and make the cut and then didn't play any good on the weekend but finished in like third to last and got a check for i think it was like just under 20 grand or like 18 19 grand something like that and i'm like this is literally better than the second place finish on the canadian tour i'm like this is absolutely nuts so that was a cool feeling and you definitely spent some time on the canadian tour i'm going to get into that in just a minute but let's go back to the farmers insurance open where you had your great finish and uh coming down the stretch or just the back nine you know kind of being up near the lead you know, did you have intentions on like pushing to try to win the golf tournament? Or were you trying to hold, like, how did you feel that day with your golf swing? Were you in a good spot mentally to feel like I can keep pushing to try to win this tournament? I know farmers isn't a place that you can play super aggressive. So just kind of want to know where your head was at on that back nine at, at the farmers this past week. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I told, I told my, my caddy or we kind of talked about it. It felt like my ball striking was getting a little bit better each and every day. Um, driver was kind of in and out as the week went on there was like some stretches during rounds where i drive it great and then sometimes where i wasn't um unfortunately my driver got flagged at uh what? the amex as being too hot and so it got <laughs> taken for me there so driver's been a little bit of a struggle this last like week and a half but um we kind of tried to figure it out as the week went on but just kind of couldn't get it fully dialed and uh so yeah i mean i i I definitely wanted to push it. I mean, my caddy knows I'm nef- never afraid to play aggressive. Um, but at the same time, at this point in my career, I mean, a, a third place means a lot more than 12th or something yes, like that. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, coming down the stretch, I mean, we both kind of said like, all right, you know, 11 and 12, let's just go hit solid shots, make par. And then 13 in, we can we can start to green light and, and get after it, especially if you can get it in the fairway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, we kind of went through the pins earlier or, uh, the night before. And we talked about how, like, you know, uh, what was it? 15 was in a bit of a bowl. 16 was tough. 17 was in a bowl and 18 was in a bowl. So it was like, you hit the fairway, you're going to, mm-hmm. you know, and you hit it solid, you're going to have good chances. So, um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately missed the fairway and 15 was able to have a good up and down there. And then 16 hit a great shot and somehow left my, my birdie putt about four feet short. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, and 17 is just like a hard fairway to hit. And, you know, unfortunately just didn't make a great swing, but, um, yeah. And then <clears throat> 18, I think if I'm playing any other tournament and I'm in any other position, I probably try to get it closer to the pin, but I was just perfectly in between two iron and four iron. And I was like, you know, I'm not going to, try to take too much distance off of a two iron that's hard in to do. situation. Yeah, exactly. And I know my tendency when I do that is to hit it left and that's not a good, you know, a fantastic place to get up and down from. So I was like, you know, I'm just going to hit it stock middle of the green. I'm like the back edge is 
you know, we were still concerned, like there could be a gust, you know, could maybe even come up short. So it was like, let's just hit it stock. If it goes over, it goes into the back part of the green, totally fine. And I was honestly surprised it carried the green too. So that was just a, (laughs) just a well struck shot. Yeah. (laughs) How far was it? Uh, I want to say we had like two, 36 front and 240 pin man so, and and in that in that kind of thick air it's not necessarily crazy warm there and you're you're considering a foreign i mean woo, yeah. that thing had to be yeah, smoke I mean, <laughs> well we didn't we didn't really consider even consider at the time at the time we were even like you know do we just take mini driver and just like pound it over the green and just get up and down like we're like we just didn't we didn't really even bring up foreign and like after the fact we talked about it and i was like i mean i hit hard to four do iron two, you know i hit two four iron two four or two thirty six so it's like if i nut it like maybe it carries and i'm like dude i'm not gonna hit it in the lake make bogey and finish the 10th after like a good solid week so because like, you t- you had told thing. me you had told me you'd hit it in that pond before when when did you do that that was in a another event yeah. or what no it was in 2015 I, when i mondayed um for the farmers oh and wow okay i want to i want to say i birdied I birdied 17 to get to even par. And I think that I thought the cut was going to be like one under or something or maybe two under or something like that. And so I thought, felt like I needed to make at least birdie, if not Eagle. And my brother was caddying for me at the time. And I was like, we're not going for this green unless we can go for it and two with an iron. And sure enough, it was like a perfect three iron at the time. And I hit it a little thin. I was like, just yell and go out of my, and uh and it landed right in the middle of the bank rolled in the water and i was like man that's a that's a crusher so, oh man and I, i'll say this about the 18th at tory pines the first time i got there as a as a kid and checked out the 18th and i'd watched that event so many times over the years on tv and that pond looks so big on tv yeah. with all the moments that have happened over the years ball spins back in the water you know the moment with tiger woods on the 18th hole at the u.s open and i get there i'm like that's it. It looks like a, just a glorified pond, like just a, yeah, it's not big at it's all. It's a, not it's intimidating. Public, you just know it's there. No. I know it's a very public course pond. It's very, it's a large puddle really. But, <laughs> it's, uh, that's what it is. It, look, it yeah. looks like you could walk right across it. Like that. It's just cement underneath it. And it's like two For feet, sure. two feet high of water is what it looks like. It's not yeah. intimidating, and, but you do know it's there with a the three iron. I'll say that. That, yeah, that's for sure. That's definitely right in your viewpoint. <laughs> well, you've uh, also got some good news from the Waste Management Phoenix Open, them calling you uh, this past week and giving you some good news, I hear. Yeah, yeah. I was on uh, a drive home yesterday with my brother and and, uh, and my coach in the car, and we were um, – the guys over at Waste Management, um, George and, and Colby, gave me a call and um, – yeah, it gave me the the word that I got a sponsor invite just in case I don't get in off my number. I think I'm, I think I'm now second alternate or something like that. So that was uh, that was pretty cool. They kind of they the way they were wording it and how it was going. I was like, oh, I feel like they're kind of letting me down soft here, and, <laughs> and I was a little bummed. And then they kind of flipped it on me and were like, we'd be honored if you'd play. So yeah, super excited to be you know heading back to Arizona tomorrow. So I'm really excited to be prepping for that. I mean, that just had to be just the, the best little mini fist pump. Just like, come on, we're finally getting some momentum and playing in the events that I want to play in. And, and you just recently moved to Scottsdale. Uh, so that that for you, you probably feel comfortable going to a golf course that you've seen plenty of times now. Yeah, no, I mean, that was and that was kind of part of the move as well. It was like, you know, I mean, might as well. I've always kind of admired guys to get the opportunity to have events at, you know, PGA Tour events or big events at their home course. And I'm like. I would love to have a little advantage at some point in one of these things. And so I was like, Scottsdale seems like the right fit for me. And with PXG being out there and, and still close enough to home, Southern California, it's a five and a half hour drive if I ever need to come back. So, um, yeah, being able to practice there, comfortable on the course. I like the course, feel like it fits my game pretty well. So, um, yeah, I'm pumped. It's going to be a, it's going to be an exciting week. Have you ever been to a waste management Phoenix open? I have not. I have <laughs> <Boy>. not. <laughs> yeah. My college, I think it was my college roommate went, I want to say either our senior year in school or maybe my first year as a pro, something like that. He went and I mean, he, <laughs> had a day. he went once and hasn't gone back. So I think <laughs> that says it all. He's retired. He's retired from being a fan at, at the Waste Managed Phoenix Open. I always love the videos yeah. that come out, not only from the, the folks that are running to get a good seat, but also like the end of the day, guys that are wobbling away and, and off the cart path trying to make it to an Uber. It's a it's quite the scene. And I'll say this as a pro, the first time 
uh, that I played at the morning tea time for the most part, like you'll, you'll, you'll sometimes get a frost delay at that event. And I remember one year I'm sitting on the putting green about to warm up and I think we were in a frost delay. So we're kind of just hanging until they gave us the go ahead. And Jake, when I, when I kid you not like the, the craziest scene, when they let the gates open, and you're sitting there on the putting green and you're just watching thousands and thousands of people in these costumes run run past you with beers in their hand. It's just the most you're like, I got to go play golf after this. Like, this is so yeah, weird. Where am I? Yeah. Yeah. My parents were thinking about coming out and I'm like, I love you guys, but I don't think you're going to enjoy like that event too much. I'm like, I say, you know, wait, come to one later in the year and, you know, we'll we'll find a better one. Plus, they're like, oh, I want to see everybody on 16. I'm like, you don't get to see 16. I'm like, you'll, you know, you'll see me hit on uh, on 15 and then I probably won't see you till 18 green because those things, I mean, being out there now in practice like those, those uh, bleachers and everything have been up since like probably October, November. So, I mean, it's, it's a full on stadium now for those, that 16, 17 and 18. I'll say this, the, there is a PGA tour credentialed area. So for family, uh, my, my, okay. my family used to always be able to get to that spot. So just, there might be somebody for you to reach out to on that, to make sure if they want to yeah. come, they can see you play on 16. I, I, I remember it. my wife, um, and my, my parents, uh, came out and did the same. I, I don't remember 17, 18. Also, I was playing with Ricky Fowler, so it was it was chaos the oh, entire man. way around. So it was it was a little <laughs> nuts. Uh, hopefully, you get a great pairing as well to experience uh, like playing with Ricky Fowler. There, it's it's pretty pretty remarkable to say to say the least. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine. So uh, I kind of want to just hit the rewind button. You're you're obviously in a great spot now in the PGA Tour, but I want to go back all the way uh, starting in college at UCLA and kind of work our way back to 2024. Uh, just kind of take me through the years. Uh, you, you didn't finish at UCLA. So let's, let's start there and then kind of work our way to when you eventually did turn pro. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I spent my, uh, freshman, sophomore, junior year at UCLA and then, um, went back for my senior year, decided to do Q school kind of in the, during that fall, um, and didn't get any status, but just kind of, had a talk with my parents and was like, listen, you guys can spend another six months paying for me to go to school or I can start trying to make some money now. And, um, you know, they were, they were, uh, nice enough to support me through that and allow me to make that decision. And they felt it, they kind of just allowed me that they were like, if you feel like you're ready and it's what you want to do, then, you know, we'll support it. But, yeah. um, but it was kind of one of those things I had to support my, myself the entire time. That was kind of part of the deal. They let me live at home or, you know, if it were up to them, I'd still live at home, but, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they let me live at home and travel out of there. So yeah, I mean, I decided to turn pro after Q school and, um, try to do like Latin America Q school and that stuff early. And I remember I missed, I had like lipped out a putt on my last hole and I'm like, man, that putt's probably gonna be important. And then sure enough comes down to the end of the event and I missed out by guaranteed spots by a shot. And I was like mm. crushed and, uh, went to Canadian Q school, missed at that. And then went up to uh, do some Mondays for Canada and Monday into Kelowna, which was like the third event. Yeah, what, um, and so what, year, what year are we in now? That was in 2016. Okay, summer so in 2016. 2016. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and so went up there. I played enough, played a few events. You know, I, I played well enough to play my way into the next few events or something. Played a couple that year um, and then came back down and in 2017, um, after that, and then one Canadian Q school. So, okay. So uh, now you're, now you're when, set on that tour. Yeah. So now I'm set in 2017, um, went up there probably, I think I finished like top five or something like that in the first event and played okay in the next couple. And then I was maybe sitting like 15 or 30 or something like that in the points list. And maybe like halfway through the season, my back really started to bother me. Mm. And so I went home, kind of got it checked out. Didn't look, didn't look super great. Went and played the next week and it was tough, like just kind of walking at that point. So decided to call the rest of that year, just a wash, um, took the rest of the season off. I ended up finishing like 58 or something like that on the points list. So it retained my status for the following year without playing. I only played I think six tournaments. Um, so went and did like, basically I had like two, two bad bulging discs and like my lower back. Um, so did mm. like decompression therapy and, and all that kind of stuff for, for probably like six months or something oh, like three days yeah. a week for like six months. Um, 
And then I was honestly super pumped for 2018, was super excited, felt super healthy, um, was starting to practice like early in the year, had like four or five months to prep and everything else. And I think this is just like the immature side of me and everything else. I just, you know, I thought I was so ready and then went up there and just played awful for an entire summer in 2018. Really? Yeah. So I just, I just don't think I really knew how to prepare for tournaments and and how to Mm -hmm. truly get myself ready. Um, and, uh, yeah. So 2018 played terrible, missed a bunch of cuts. And even if I made the cut kind of had like a crummy day on Saturday Mm -hmm. or Sunday and finished in 30th and you just don't get any points for that. So, um, ended up losing my status in Canada in 2018. Um, and was in the off season. I think it was like October. So right when Q school is about to start and a moment I'll never forget. I'm just in the, in the gym with my buddy. He's going to go run to the bathroom real quick before we start our workout work. We have a bath, like a kind of a basketball court in our gym. We were working out at the time. And, uh, these guys asked if I, we needed one more and we used to play pickup basketball every night of the week. And so Love I was that. like, yeah, sure. I'll Love run that. one while my buddy's getting warmed up. Why not? Or going to the bathroom. Why not? So I jump in there and like two plays into the game, jump up, come down on a guy's foot and then roll, roll my ankle terribly and tear three ligaments in my left foot. <laughs> so the conversation didn't go over too well with my parents on that one came in limping. And I was like, man, I, my life is over. This is done. And then, and they also at that point, I mean, so I had turned pro in 2016, signed a three-year deal with TaylorMade out of college uh, or TaylorMade and Adidas. And so I was set for 2016, 17, 18. So at that point I was basically a free agent. Mm-hmm. Well, as a free agent, just lost my status in Canada, just rolled my ankle, not doing Q school this year. And that was kind of like the first question mark for me, whether it was like, or where I was like, you know, if I wanted to, I could kind of, I could kind of just stop now, you know, it's like my, you know, it's like, I don't know. It just didn't really seem like it was panning out for me. The timing wasn't good. You know, was I never the, got any sponsors. Was the passion still there? Like, was the love for the game all still there? Were you like getting that frustrated to where you're like, yeah, like, I'm, I'm done with this. Yeah. I think I just got tired of people telling me like, oh, you'll be out there and, you know, or why aren't you out there, you know, playing in college against Rom and Spieth and Justin mm-hmm. and all these guys who are having so much success. And, um, and I just flat out wasn't. And, um, so yeah, I think I was just kind of fed up with that side of it. And then also, um, you know, just hadn't had any success on my own. And I have, I have a tattoo on the inside of my right arm that says confidence comes from doing. And I just felt like I hadn't done anything yet. So I hadn't like earned the right for that confidence. So I just think I was struggling in that department. Um, and you know, anytime my brain kind of went that direction, I was just, I was like, you know, there's nothing else I want to do. Like I still, I had like the passion never left. Like I loved practicing every single day. I'm at the course 24 seven. I'm not one of those guys that has like a ton yeah. of other hobbies and things they love doing. So, um, whether I played with golf competitively or professionally or not, like I love being around the course and that's mm-hmm. just, that's just my place. So, um, yeah, I, I had to take, you know, all of October, November, December. I remember I started to kind of make some, some one footed swings in like kind of January ish. And then, um, oh, which foot was it? Left or right? Left foot. Oh, even worse. And, uh, I, feel like that's and I had kind of, I had kind of one of those like active, like Justin Thomas style footwork where like my left toe came off the ground and mm-hmm. I hated that part about my swing. I always wanted to like, kind of like Ricky, I wanted to like punch it into my left heel and post up my left leg. I just thought it looked better. And, uh, so when my left ankle stopped working, all of a sudden that just became how I swing. I was like, wow, this is, this is great. <laughs> kind of fixed my flaw. Um, <laughs> And I got, I got lucky enough to get set up at the end of 2018, the, the old head pro at my home course, Tom Sargent, who taught Bob May pretty much his entire career and some other guys out on, out on tour. Um, he set me up with a guy who was, who had invested a few times in, in players in the past, um, but only really like two different guys and really nice guy member at a course nearby. And, uh, you know, we sat down and had lunch. I told him that, I don't have the money basically to fund this next season, but I would love to play. Um, and so he was generous enough to, you know, we negotiated a deal where he got a percentage of what I earned and then, Mm -hmm. you know, but it allowed me, it allowed me to pay for golf and play golf. So I was like, listen, I live at home. Like I don't have a lavish lifestyle. Like my expenses are almost nothing outside of golf. So I was like, if you're willing to take care of it, I'm all in. And, uh, 
And then I write like shortly after that, I won Q school again in 2019 for Canada. Wow. Um, Two time uh, Canadian Q school champion, Jake. Yeah, I, don't know to. <laughs> I know. I don't know if that's the title. Should've I let, remember they made a, I should have let off with that, that man. You, you didn't, you didn't tell me that the other day. I, I, yeah, that was I, a, the, the I best way to start. Down, I must've taken down the two time champ banner behind me or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that was 2019. I, or that was the start of 2019. I won one Q school again out at Wigwam. Um, actually played in the final round of Will Zalatoris, which really is, wow, which is pretty funny. Um, and it was kind of one of those moments where both of us, I think, were playing there. And for me, especially seeing him, I'm like, what are you like? What are you doing here? Like, we both <laughs> know you're going to get plenty of sponsor exemptions. Like, you yeah. don't, you don't need to be doing any of this. Um, and uh, yeah, I was able to win that and got Canadian tour status and you know, I think my perspective changed a little bit on everything. I was very appreciative just to be playing and, um, was proud of like the work I was putting in. And I think a little for not forgotten about, I mean, luckily I mean, yeah. tricks on signed me. Um, well, and I think McDonald's. I know who signed you too. It was, uh, Mike Dunphy. Mike is, Dunphy. He's a neighbor of yeah. mine, which is, which is why I've always looked out for your name. I've known your name probably since you've been signed by them because Dumphy had, has told me how good you are. So I've, that's, <laughs> that's where like, I've, I, I think I probably remember your name just from like UCLA in itself, but then he was like, no, this kid's legit. Yeah, that's, that's Dump. He was, <laughs> he was yeah. the man. He's, he's a great guy and he was, he's still my biggest fan. He, he still texts me and everything else. He's awesome. Right. And, uh, um, yeah, they, they signed me on for three years. I went, I remember I asked Taylor made if I could get a new set of irons for that season and basically got a text back saying like, yeah, it's going to be X dollars per club if you want them. And I was like, that stuff. I'm like, there it is right there. And that really, uh, and that, I mean, that's, on. that's tough. You know, like, I mean, you just get, you get free clubs, free balls for so long. And then until you get to a point where it's like, wait, I got to start paying for this. Like this, that's a, that's a reality yeah. check for any pro golfer it's like this is where club companies see me but i know i i'm way better than what they're seeing right now so that, that had to be a tough pill yeah. to swallow for sure for sure yeah that one hurt especially like i've been with them since i was like a sophomore in high school so it was like you know it's almost like one of those really like come on guys like it's it's me like you've taken care of me for so long like you know i always represented you guys well and everything but you know it just comes down to performance and like i've always yeah. loved I've always loved that part of the sport in general. Um, you know, like I, I love basketball, baseball, soccer, all that kind of stuff, but I always wanted to be the one to take the last shot. If it was a baseball game, I want to be the one that's at bat. Like I just, I always wanted to be that person. So that's why I think golf was always kind of my calling. It's like, I want, I want the ball in my hands at all times. So, um, and there's good side of that and bad side. It's like, you know, if you play poorly, it's only you to blame, play well, you get all the credit, but, I right. love, I love that part of it. Well, can we fast forward a little bit to, uh, I mean, eventually like the story that kind of broke out and we had James Nitties on our podcast about uh, a couple of weeks ago, who I'm sure you've gotten to know a little bit uh, through the corn Ferry tour. And, and he had kind of mentioned that your storyline was interesting because you worked at a, uh, called a restaurant turning into a nightclub called the country club, which for a golfer, it's like similar to when I was at LSU, the bar that we all went to was called bogeys. So it's like, you know what? It kind of goes hand in hand. It's like, if your parents ask where you're going to say, I'm going to the country club, you know, just got to get some work done. But for you, yep. when did, when did, uh, when did that job become open for you? Because I think you were on and off the Canadian tour and, and just looking for a paycheck at, at, at the time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So like we were just saying like 2019, I went up there and I won, I won twice and, and earned corn fairy status. So I went on corn fairy during that, that COVID season and played decent at the start. I had like a top 10 in Mexico and was like, all right, like, there we go, get the year going. And then the season shut down. And, uh, unfortunately it was just like, never, was just like never really able to, to find my footing after that for some reason, just, I don't know if it was time away from competition or what, it really was not able to, you know, get in a routine, but after those two years just made little to no money, didn't play well at all. Um, and so I lost my status and, you know, I played 20 and 21. And so I lost my status after 21 and then go to Dude, Q school are, in the summer. Four about, long, these are four long years. Like the, just going through yeah. all this, this is a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, 
been a while. I mean, I've been professional now for eight years. So, yeah. you know, I know people call me a, call me a young man still and all that kind of stuff, but I've been, I've been at it since, I you feel know, old, late. Yeah. yeah, I've been at it since 22, 21 ish. So, um, yeah, I mean, losing, losing status there stinks. And what, what a lot of the people don't realize is like when you lose status on the corn ferry, you lose your status, which means you're probably not playing very well. And then they're like, congratulations, come pay X amount of dollars. You're going to do Q school in two weeks. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you get a few months to reset, prepare, get ready. It's like <laughs> you're playing crappy. I hope you can figure it out next week because that's going to set up your next 10 months. So, um, so that one sucked. I mean, I got, I had to go all the way back to first stage. I went to like an overflow site in Chicago and it was like, 80 corn fairy guys because it was all the guys kind of waiting to see if they were going to have status or not um and was able to get through there and then went to new mexico for second stage and just wasn't wasn't my week didn't play well finished in like 30th and didn't get through um mm -hmm. and literally as soon as as soon as that finished i went home and we talked to my brother and i was like dude i need i need to do something like i need a job whatever and at the time or he still kind of has his own real estate deal and he's like just come work for me i'll, I'll help you out with her and i was like i don't i don't want handouts i don't want mm -hmm. people just to throw me a few bucks here and there and so yeah i started looking at places that would hire like a bar back or maybe security or do something like that and uh went to a few places they said they were kind of full and then the same mm -hmm. owner owns a lot of different bars in our area and they were like oh there's this bar up in costa mesa that could could use some new security if you're looking for that and i was like oh, i know that place isn't like too crazy like i'll give it a go and uh yeah i started working there in october of 21 um and uh worked there all the way until may of may of 22 right after i worked there the weekend after my first canadian tour event in 22 but um yeah worked there for like eight nine months man just listening to you hear you say that and and going back you know 20 minutes to the beginning of our conversation talking about what it was like coming down the stretch to try to win a PGA tour event and then just hear you kind of go through the last 10 minutes of of where you've been in this crazy game it it reminds me of the journey um not quite nearly as long uh, as Eric Coles but a guy that just grinded and grinded and grinded and just kind of kept hitting the rock as Max Homa has, has said plenty of times and eventually that rock is going to break and and for you I mean I can't imagine the amount of nights that you just sat there dealing with probably the most bullcrap stuff of 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 drunk arguments and throwing people out <laughs> where you're sitting there thinking to yourself is like man is this is this like what life has in store for me you know like is this kind of you know where I'm heading like were there moments like that at one in the morning where you're just sitting there like thinking like man this is this is tough right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for sure. I mean, cause working somewhere like that, I mean, I was there every Friday, Saturday night, you know, I worked New Year's Eve and Christmas Eve and Christmas. I worked Christmas wow. night, actually. That was a wild one. Uh, and then, you know, Halloween, all that kind of stuff. But even just like the regular every Friday, Saturday night from get there at eight 30, leave. If we were lucky, we'd leave by like two 30, but usually it was like three. Um, and yeah, it was just, uh, it was definitely, I mean, cause most of the time you're just kind of standing there with a flashlight, just making sure nobody's doing anything they're not supposed to. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, especially in those, especially in those quiet nights, I mean, towards the, the last like five months, I was the one standing at the front door, checking IDs and doing all that kind of stuff. And it was like, like, man, what am I doing here? You know, it's like, this isn't what I'm supposed to be doing, but you know, I had somebody give me a good piece of advice. It's like, you are where you are for a reason. So yep. if you don't want to be there, work your way out of it. And, uh, so, you know, I didn't, I decided not to play many mini tour events before that Canadian season two. I was just like, you know, I'm just going to, just going to grind, you know, I'm just going to practice, mm. get better at the things that I've always said I needed to get better at. And I'm just going to smash those things head on, stop avoiding all the little stuff that maybe I didn't, you know, right. didn't give the full attention to. Um, and just that, that kind of gave me like the realization. It's like, like what a, not like what a waste, but um it's like what a waste it would be to like stop you know and because mm -hmm. i don't i felt like if i would have stopped at any of those moments i would have been like you haven't even tried yet you know it's like you said you're a professional golfer and you said you've been giving it a go but it's like you haven't given all of it i you know it's like i made sacrifices and stuff but i was like i can i can be doing a lot more and so mm -hmm. um i think my close family and friends have looked over the last two years and i think there's been a drastic change of of like how much time i spend on task and how I treat my, you know, I, I mean, I treat it very much like a, 
round the clock job. You know, I don't really do yeah. much else. It's what I want to do. So like I've said these last couple of years, it's like, I just want to squeeze, feel like I squeeze every last drop out of my potential. And, uh, you know, that's, that's just kind of been the goal for the last, the last two years now. Yeah. That's, I mean, that, that rededication, it sounds like just the being in a, in a, a different place and having the perspective to, to realize like, Hey, I still have the talent, but I, I really need to go put the work in. And that's uh, probably why you are where you're standing now. But I have a couple <laughs> more questions about the country club because it's such a, uh, yeah. a fascinating thing. We don't have many bar backs on the PGA tour or, or security no. uh, bouncers. Uh, is there anybody on the PGA tour that's currently playing right now that you feel like can correctly identify a fake ID better than you? <laughs> um, that's a great question. Probably not. <laughs> yeah, honest. you would think uh, so, right? <laughs> I got, I got pretty, I got pretty good after a while. As soon as you get it in your hands, like I, it's so funny. Cause like, you know, buddies in college and stuff had fake IDs. Like I never looked old enough. So I kid you not, I could <laughs> yeah. never even Me fake it if I wanted to. And, uh, and so there would be people that would come up and they hand me their ID. And the first thing is always like confidence and eye contact. You can just tell when a person's <laughs> handing you something that's fake. And sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it's the way it looks. Sometimes it's just the way, as soon as you pick it up, it either feels like a piece of cardboard or it's super thin or whatever it might be. And like, I wouldn't even have to look at it. I'd be like, you can have this back and you guys have a nice night. So yeah, it was, it was So what are you supposed funny. to do if I have a fake ID and I was going to hand it to you? What, what do I, what's, do I not need to look at you and not be confident? Just, no, you gotta, you gotta look, be confident, maybe try to distract me, ask me how the night's going, ask how it is inside, but don't, don't hand it to me and then look immediately at your toes and, you know, oh, oh, you're saying, to okay, so I, okay, you're saying that eye contact and having confidence is what you need to have. I thought you were saying sure. the opposite. Okay. That, that was like, Oh, yeah. what are you supposed to do then? Cause I, I had yeah. it all wrong in my head. <laughs> no. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta go up there with some confidence. Can't, you can't go in there knowing that you got your, uh, your big brother's ID and you're not 29 years old when you're really 19. That's a tough one. <laughs> we need to, <laughs> we need to find a way to clip this and tag all of the high school seniors that are heading to college next year to, to really just yep. give them an idea from a, a, a true no pro true here that can, that can yeah. sniff out these <laughs> fake IDs. <laughs> yeah. There's also, I mean, it's funny too, cause there's some bars around where we are that take pride in taking fake IDs. Like mm. they have a shoe box full of them and yeah. they love taking them. And then there's other places that are like, if you just show any form of identification, you know, you're good. And like the, the funniest thing is the amount of people that have come up to me that are quite obviously 20, whether they're like 30, 40, 50 years old and they don't have an ID. And I'm like, listen, I would love, I'd love to let you in. I'm like, we have a very strict ID process where if you don't have an identification, like I can't let you in. If something happens and please show up and they ask, mm -hmm. ask for IDs, I can't let you. So the amount of people that were upset with me <laughs> night in, night out, just 10, 20 times a night of like, look at me. I'm obviously 21. It's like, that's well, congratulations, but you don't have an identification and I can't let you in. I'm so sorry. All right. So, so you, but you were like 20 pounds heavier, right? But you're the guy that really was the, he was the, the muscle behind you. A guy named Tim, you, you mentioned to me, he was the guy that said, Hey man, you got any problems? Like he's the guy to, to, you know, pony up and say, you know, yeah, yeah. we got any issues. This is, it gets to settled you, real quick. Yeah. To give you an idea, I mean, we have, we have Tim who's our head of security and he's the nicest guy in the world. I mean, if, if you work hard and do what you're supposed to, he'll treat you right. I mean, he always, like when anytime I had tournaments, he, he knew that this was a side gig and he understands that. So, um, he let me do whatever I needed to do. But when I first walked in my first night, I started with this guy, Juwan and Juwan was trying to also play professional football. Super good dude. We're still good friends now. Um, and we both start the same night. Uh, and the top three guys who have been there the longest, I mean, Tim being the head of security, this other guy, big T and he's, <laughs> you know, big human being six foot four and also just the nicest guy. And then we had another guy nicknamed alpha and alpha oh, was about, go. what was your six, nickname? Nothing. Oh uh, yeah, I man. Didn't that, like map dog or something. Just something. No, <laughs> no, they just call me, call Kill me whatever they wanted to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, everybody knew that I was that I was a nice guy and I wasn't I wasn't the one that was going to get in the middle of anything if I didn't absolutely need to yeah um, especially once they all found out uh, that I played golf it was almost as if everybody was trying to protect me which was pretty funny you need to protect your wrists um, and your hands too man that's you don't the last thing you need is to to break a hand so, during all that for sure so no we had a, we had a good crew then and some guys who were willing and able to step in if anything was was needed did you hear from any of those guys after your, your big finish at the farmers? 
Uh, yeah, Tim, Tim reached out immediately, sent me a message. Uh, Juwan sent me a message. Um, that's cool. Man. The other guys I haven't talked to, but yeah, Tim, Tim still reaches out every single week and he's, and he's well connected in like the sports kind of industry. He played at USC for football, played in the NFL for a little while. Dad played in the NFL for a really long time. So, um, he's always reaching out with, you know, go see this guy for PT, for training, whatever, you know, and obviously football and golf are a little bit different, but I always appreciated talking to him about, you know, playing in any sport at a high level, you know, is, is pretty yeah. special. So you can always learn something from anybody, but, um, yeah, they've been awesome reaching out and sending messages and all kinds of stuff. Man, that's awesome. That's, that's so cool. And, uh, I, I just kind of had mentioned that you, you said to me that you were around like 10 to 20 pounds heavier. I'm not sure if that was muscle or not. And I was reading uh, yeah. something on online that had mentioned that if you did something other than the golf, you would be a fitness instructor, uh, which I kind of led to, all right, what do we know Jake about Jake Knapp as the golfer right now? And it's that you can absolutely drop mail and you can just hit nukes. Okay. And so I, I have to ask you, uh, from a fitness standpoint, what did, what do you, what do you bench, bro? You know, what, what do you bench? <laughs> <laughs> what, not, what do you squat, too, man? What, what, yeah, what's your no, literally. <laughs> I've, uh, I've done a good job of lightening all that stuff up over the past few years. Um, <laughs> did you but, go meathead uh, at any point? Like, or did we get, do oh, we get yeah. in? Oh, let's 100%. go. All right. Throw some numbers yeah. at me. Uh, the heaviest, uh, what was it? The heaviest I ever squatted was 365 for four, I believe. Uh, so, or six, four, <laughs> six. I'd have to look. I have a whiteboard in my garage that has it all written down. And then the most I ever benched, uh, was 260 for two. So, 260 for two okay you're gonna have to send me a yeah. picture of this whiteboard because this is gonna I definitely will. definitely make it in because when when people see videos of of you that broke break the internet of your golf swing going viral with your driver which is probably why your your driver got flagged in the first place it's like wait yeah. wait this guy hits 190 yeah. ball speed and it looks like he's swinging it like a wedge well let's yeah. let's turn back the page let's a little bit and this it. guy can he can move some weight back in the day yeah for sure and i mean i i still can i mean my i will say the only the one big investment I made after last season getting out here um, is I upgraded my home gym. So I've always had um, since 2020 ish or basically like just before COVID and it was very good timing. I was like wanting to do it forever. I always wanted to work out at home because the gym mm -hmm. um, that I worked out at forever um, growing up ended up closing during COVID. Mm. and so i kind of wanted to have my own place I, I hate i'm not a big public gym guy i like old <sighs> dirty rusty gym yeah mm -hmm. and uh so i've always had a squat rack and some some cable stuff and everything else but then i decided to upgrade dumbbells new barbell trap bar kettlebells so a bunch of different stuff so now i have dumbbells going from 10 to 150 or 110 pounds um i got like i don't even know how much in weight but a lot um, 110 and pounds. Have you, everything I home. would just look have just, they would, I would just stare at those. Yeah. Like, those would just be something that's like a trophy. Yeah. How often do the one tens come yeah, out? We could not too often. That's more of an off season thing. So yeah. I usually okay. don't touch above 90 this time of year. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I just, I love training. I mean, I've always loved, I've honestly always loved the bodybuilding community as my old like college teammates know and all that kind of stuff. Like I almost follow bodybuilding more than I follow professional golf. So really, um, yeah, it's just, I mean, I don't as much now I should say I did through college and early professional life, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I just, I don't know. I always loved it. I've actually formed a small relationship with Steve cook, which some people might not know, but, um, he's big in the me bodybuilding in. Yeah, and me in. world. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was the first, um, men's physique champion in the Olympia, which like the Olympia is like the Olympics for bodybuilding. Um, and there's different divisions and, and whatnot. So you have like the open class, you have the 212 class, which 212 is the max weight. Um, now they have classic physique, which Chris Bumstead has been the champion now for, I think four years. Um, and then he was the first men's physique champion, which is like kind of more of like a, just a, buff guy it's not like crazy over the okay. top it's not like crazy roided out anything like that um he's probably if i had to guess six two and 215 pounds but he's just ripped great shape and he's a diehard golfer now which is hilarious great so um i think he actually might be coming out to the waist next week i'm trying to i'm trying Sick. to finagle him and get him to come out but um but yeah so i mean i've, I've just always loved 
love that side of it. I've always just loved training, loved working out hard. A lot of the guys at my, um, kind of a lot of the guys, or not a lot, but a few of the guys I grew up with working out and whatnot kind of chased bodybuilding. And, um, so yeah, it's always been a, a sport and whatnot that I've been fascinated with. Okay. You know, I have to ask you, have you ever, have you ever entered into a bodybuilding competition? Had to no, ask. but it's always, it's always been my dream. Okay. That's always, that's always been the, uh, the side hustle. That's always been something I want to do, whether when I'm, whether I do it when I'm 60, 50, 40, I don't care, but well, eventually I'd love to do something like that. Invite me. I'm going, I'm going to be your hype man. The guy out there, Deal. just, you know, the foam finger, you know, I don't, <laughs> or I can be the tan guy, you know, whatever to make sure that, that we, we get, get everything. No problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what would be your biggest hurdle for bodybuilding? What body part for you is like the hardest one to get right for bodybuilding, I guess. Uh, I mean, nowadays, probably, probably my legs again, just cause I used to, I mean, I still love training legs. It's my favorite thing to train over the last couple of years, but I had a knee issue the last couple of years with like tearing my quad tendon. So, um, I just had to, uh, no, funny enough. I mean, it was like a wear and tear injury. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, but it happened when I was on the golf course, my, all of a sudden my quad just started to like tighten up, tighten up, tighten up. And like, this is really weird. And I was just walking like nothing crazy. And it felt like a crazy Charlie horse and, and all of a sudden I couldn't bend my leg for a week. And I was like, man, this what? isn't, this isn't normal. Um, so it's much better now, but I just overall getting like the mass on is the hardest thing. Cause you can't really, you can't miss meals. You have to stay on top of everything. And with so our much schedule, eating, sounds like. <laughs> yeah. And like, and I love that part. Like I stay in Airbnbs every week. I cook every meal. I, that's, that's kind of my, really? my side thing. Yeah. But, um, and kind of for that reason, I've always like, I've never been a big foodie. Like I enjoy good food. Don't get me wrong, but I very much eat for fuel. So I eat the same things day in, day out very much. Like my, my diet and my training program is very much similar to a, to a bodybuilder basically. All right. So you had to whole foods on a, a Sunday or a Monday when you get into town, what are you buying then? Same, same things pretty much every week. I'll buy a big bag of jasmine rice. I'll buy ground turkey, ground chicken, either broccoli or asparagus. Um, the same couple different like hot sauces that I always get. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that'll be about it. And then I pretty much I'll eat breakfast at the course, um, and probably snack on lunch there. So then usually I'll have like a meal before I go to the gym and then shake when I get back and then probably a meal before I go to bed as well. I mean, fuel, fuel is power. And we, and we talked about that power and, uh, where with your driver, are you like, where are you cruising on the golf course with ball speed wise? Ball speed, probably like high eighties, I would say mid to high eighties, like 85 to 89, somewhere in that. If I'm, yeah, same here. Guess. yeah it's probably same. Here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, Look, I, what's, what's the fastest you've ever gotten? I know I've, I know I've like, well, I mean, I have a video last year of getting, I think it was like literally 199.8, like on the range in Ohio. We State. round up. We round up. Yeah, exactly. 200 for sure. Um, but I remember I worked with Mark Blackburn for a short stint and yeah. um, we were hitting in, uh, at his facility. <laughs> yeah, here in Birmingham. And yeah, my, absolutely. Just 15 minutes on the road. We were doing a ton of wedge work at the time. We were working together. And then he was like, also, I need to make sure you train your speed because I can't have you getting slower doing all this wedge stuff. So like, you need to make sure you train to go fast. And so we did some speed work, you know, just kind of that day messing around. And he was just like, all right, that's pretty quick. And I'd never gotten over 136 club head speed. That's always been my cap. And 100 what is like 130 100. what? 136 was my <laughs> Dude, it doesn't look like you're to. moving the club that fast. Like, yeah. I, I, like you're, do you just have like a crazy stiff shaft? Like, or do you feel like you're swinging like it really hard? Cause it doesn't look fast at all. No, I mean, that's always kind of been my thing with training, to be honest, is I always, I mean, the physical side to it with like growing up watching Tiger all my life, I always thought that he just looked physically dominant. You know, like you watched him at a course, he just, his posture was good. He looked strong yeah. and it, it just looked intimidating to me. So I was like, man, I want to step on the first tee and I want to intimidate guys. And um, so that kind of started it, but then, yeah, I mean, for me, training has always been one of those things where it's like, if I can, if I can get it to, let's say 127 club head speed with driver, I want to be able to swing it at 127 with the least amount of effort as possible. So if I can just get stronger and get faster and have it 
still go the same speed with less effort. I mean, ideally it should get put less stress on my back and wrists and shoulders and all that. Um, and for the most part, I just let my body move how it wants to move. I mean, everybody kind of has their own swing and their own deal. Yeah. And I feel like if you swing a club, or a club long enough, your body's going to just kind of figure out right. a way to do it. And so I've tried to change a few things and, and manage it in a certain way, but for the most part, I kind of just let my body move how it wants to. And if that's the speed it wants to go at, then I'm all for it. So I definitely, I definitely have levels and I can definitely go a lot faster with that on course speed to me. Usually my, my number one swing thought is smooth, like cruise it. Like I try not to try not to swing too fast, try not to go too crazy. You know, you'll, you'll definitely know when I go after some, I'm sure there'll be a few at some point this year, but you'll, you'll definitely be able to tell when I'm going at it. Are you playing Vedanta in Mexico? Yeah, I will be there. Send it, brother. Send it. I mean, <laughs> it is a funny. full I looked, send fest. I looked through some uh, some of the tournament. I tried to pick a few tournaments this year that I thought fit my game well based on the courses and whatnot. So I looked through some of the past champions and guys who hit it far and maybe have similar attributes to me. And I saw that Fino won that one. I was just like, all right, let's put a little star around Mexico. Apparently, that's going to be you're going to love that place. Good course, if you hit it far. You're gonna love that place. A lot of a lot of the uh, players are hitting six, five, and four irons into into some par four greens where you're gonna have eight, nine irons. So that'll be a huge yeah. advantage that week. But uh, and as it goes to strategy, you kind of just talked about how you want to be smooth at 127. You know, a lot of players that are really long take a lot of pride and have a bit of an ego to how far they hit the golf ball. Like they'd rather be top 10 in the driving statistic than top 10 in the scoring average because they hit it so far. Like for you, yeah. do you, do you feel like you have to be one of the longest players on tour? Or do you, or do you, is that the type of strategy you take into a golf course week in week out? Are you a, a guy that just, he kind of p- picks his way around or are you somebody that always hits driver uh, w- whenever you can? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I, it's funny. So, I mean, that was kind of like last year for me is I felt like everybody always told me that the corn fairy didn't suit me well, or like we'd show up that nothing ever pissed me off more than we'd show up to a course that's just big and open and no trouble and guys would be like, Oh, you must love this week. And it's like, what tells you what, what's telling you that? Like, I don't, I hate open courses. I mean, look at how I played in the desert the other week. I hate open courses with big fairways and big area. Like I have a tough time focusing. It just doesn't, I need to figure out how to play better on those some weeks, but, um, but yeah, so I'm not a big fan of those courses. And I, if, you know, I think last year was big for me cause I proved that I can play um, on a lot of different styles of courses, um, whether it's long, short, tree lines, yeah. open links, you or whatever. Sony. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, Sony putted bad on the weekend, but yeah, I mean, everybody was like, Oh, Sony's a, you're not going to have many drivers and it's short, tight dog legs and whatever. And it's like, okay, so it's like Canada, you know, like I'll go <laughs> hit two iron everywhere and I'll have a nine iron contest. Like I'm okay with that. Yeah. So I've always tried to be as well-rounded as I possibly can. I mean, obviously my length, um, not everybody has the ability to do that, mm-hmm. but if you would have put me on tour two or three years ago or four years ago, like, yeah, I'd be ego chasing and I'd just be swinging out of my shoes every time and hitting it all over the planet. But I kind of know I'm comfortable with who I am. Like, I know I can swing it fast. Like it's, you know, it just kind of is what it is. And, it, and it's funny when some guys, you know, whether they think they hit it super far or they want to have a contest and this and that, whatever, it's like, like, I, you know, it's just not, not for me. Or when somebody says like, Oh, you're only number three right. in driving distance with this week. So-and-so is faster. And it's like, okay, like it's fine. Good for them. You know, like I'm okay with it. That's fine. Like I know I can move it quick. Like I, I'm just trying to play the best golf I can. I'm trying to shoot the lowest score. Like whether that means I choke up and hit every drive at 120 club head speed, or I'd lengthen out and swing everyone at 131. I'll do whatever's necessary and whatever the course calls for. So, so you're telling me like two or three years ago when you were teeing off, you would have a protein shake in your back pocket and raw, raw eggs in your front pocket just after tee yep. shots. <laughs> I mean, I still have a protein shake in my bag every week. This, Let's this, go. Uh, these Let's last go. three or four seasons, that's my thing. I don't, I hate eating on the course. I can't stand it. So I just have a protein shake the turn and I go about my business. <laughs> uh, and, and you you mentioned the, uh, the gym that you have at your own home. Is that a, uh, like that, that to me, like I, I picture you being like a Bill Belichick cut off hoodie and, and cut off on the sleeves. Is that, is that the workout attire for you? 
I'm a sweatpants and I'm a sweatpants and hoodie guy. And if you don't okay. see the sweat through the hoodie, you ain't working hard enough. So oh, that's um, my man. God, put, yeah. print it on a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, I'm old. I'm old school in that way. I like. I hate the the matching fits into the gym and all that kind of stuff. Like if you see in the see me in the gym, I'll probably be wearing like either Vans or crappy high tops or something or whatever. It's just like I don't know. It's just more my thing. I'm not a workout yeah. gear guy or anything like that. And uh, yeah, my gym's dirty and dusty and, you know, love there's it. stuff written all over the place. And yeah. I so. love that. I mean, we've got the Michael Jordan uh, picture behind you. Just, yeah, yep. I'm, I'm here for that. And, oh, yeah. And, uh, and so you said Airbnbs, you know, that you rent those throughout the year, you cook your own food and any, any player that I've ever kind of talked to or, you know, asked about like, Hey, where, you know, where are you staying? And, and if they're like a guy that always stays in Airbnbs, those are the guys that are always traveling with like their Xbox or PlayStation. Are you one of those guys? I used to be. Uh, I was about I mean, to say, like, I, I had you yeah. pegged. I feel like you got to be like a Call of Duty guy or like a uh, something like that. Yeah, I'm I'm a big video game guy. I mean, I'm talking to you right now on my gaming laptop. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I'm a big I'm a big video game guy. I love that stuff. I used to travel with it more. Um I don't really anymore. It's like if I was going to be gone for like seven weeks or something like that and I really wanted to, then I would bring it. But these days, I mean, I'm not really traveling much more than like three, four days a week. So I just yeah. let it let it stay at home. But yeah, my place in Arizona, I have my nice. I mean, it's right in the middle of my living room. My place isn't too <laughs> isn't too fancy. It's simple, just golf clubs and gaming. So, um, yeah, but I have that that set up. I play Apex and Call of Duty mostly. Okay. Um, Bring Verdance and, back uh, or no? Hopefully, golly, I don't play much Call of Duty anymore because I just think it's terrible now. But yeah, uh, it's, it's it's not great. I I uh, yeah, I had to quit when I had a baby. But man, during COVID, there was nothing better waking up at nine a.m. and and all the boys oh. are on and there's just nothing yep. going on during the day. So we just we I just mean, grind literally. until we get hungry at lunchtime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was like our routine. Like since I was the one at the gym stuff, it was literally you know I have a group of a group chat of you know. 10 guys or something like that and we've all been friends forever and so uh, and some of them still live around me so I mean we would just text each other in the morning we'd get on and then once we'd get off to eat everybody would come over we'd all work out together go back home play until midnight you know and it was just that was the life is your is your gamer tag Jake nap golf uh it is not it's okay. uh, it, it's nap time though so it's nap time it's oh i like that time. okay yeah well, mine's sid to sniper <laughs> I, I was the uh i was the bot uh that just kind of was the you know when we played Fortnite, i was the guy that always had i was like the medic you know i, I was just the cleanup oh, crew if you will so you know i, I was who's there for the morale who's got the meds yeah. yeah i was there for morale you know the grenade guy i was always you know just mr utility man and for dance, I had to ask this too. Where was y'all's drop spot? Ours was hospital. We went to we went to military. Up in the uh, top we never right we never map. we never saw each other then. So uh, yeah. we were we we were right That's in the middle of it, the top of hospital the, every single time. <laughs> that is awesome. I love it. <laughs> it was it was a heck of a grind. And and uh, the last question on video games. So did you play any like Tiger Woods games? Like were those some of the ones you grew up playing? For sure. Yeah. Did you play like yeah, any the PGA Tour courses this year? That you're like, I'm excited to see like it in person and not on a video game. I didn't. Um, I think, gosh, what was it? The only we we kind of got into it for a little while once Call of Duty got kind of bad. We played PGA Tour those different games for a little bit. Is um, it good? And I was, um, they're okay. Like yeah. you know, I mean, they're they're fun. Like you go and play with four guys and just have a good time and make little bets and whatnot. And it's a, it's a fun time. But I always kind of was a little biased towards what courses we were going to play. Like I always <laughs> wanted to play Tori. I mean, Tori's always just been one of my favorite courses ever. Um, and then also I always picked the ones that I've played before. So I kind of knew the idea of <laughs> as long as they made the video game correctly, this slope should be here. Ball should go this way. And it was give myself a little insider information. It was like Tiger Woods. I think it was like 07 is the game that I, I I distinctly remember to be able to hit the power up with the B button to get the drive, yeah. and then and then controlling the spin while the ball's in the air. I mean, although the like button, graphic mash spin, yeah, yeah. it just like and then you're just changing in all the directions based <laughs> on like how it's flying into the green. So uh, I I miss I miss playing that game. The graphics probably if you played it now, you'd be like, I can't believe. I was okay with like this, like how it looks, but yeah. Oh, literally. I mean, that's, it's so funny when I look at that stuff now, cause we still, 
you know, like I'll still have like my Nintendo 64 set up sometimes and play on that thing. And I'm like, it's hilarious that this is like revolutionary, you know, not that long ago either, which <laughs> is know. nuts. I mean, even now I play in a PC versus an Xbox and I'll come back and like, look at one of my buddy's Xbox or look at my brother's or something like that. I'm like, how do you play on this thing? Yeah. And that's I'm what like, you'd be saying it. in my house too, but I don't get yeah. to play anymore. <laughs> my so, setup was so. always an issue. I would be like sitting so far away from the TV, but it was all just about like having my morning cup of coffee and just having good vibes with yeah. the boys. <laughs> that's the thing. That's what people don't realize too. It's like, I don't, I, 99% of the time, if I'm playing video games, I'm playing with like some buddies because I'm, you know, want to talk to somebody, haven't yeah. seen them in a while, whatever it might be. I'm like, I, I very rarely, if ever sit down and just play video games by myself. And if I do, it's probably for 30 minutes. And I'm like, all right, this is boring. I'm getting off. <laughs> and, so. and as soon as I, if I would have ever bought like a PC gaming laptop and cause that would be the moment that I like, like would take trying to be better at video games seriously. And my wife would be like, wait, are you seriously going to yeah. invest in becoming a better, better video game player? And so I never, <laughs> I never was able to take the leap into actually getting yeah. a good gaming setup. So and, and, and probably rightfully so I didn't need to be doing that while I was playing video games. For the most part, I was playing like crap. So I, I probably yeah. didn't need to be playing at all anyways. <laughs> yeah, I know that was, that was kind of my thing is I was like, you know, I've had some tournaments where I've played well and brought my video games and I've had some where like I brought my setup with me and traveled with all this junk and then I don't even Can't open it for three weeks. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And it's like, I got all these different things. I'm like, how about we just leave it at home? And like, we enjoy playing video games when we're home and then that's it. And so that's kind of what it's turned into now. All right, it's nap time. Sid to Snipe and I, we might have to do a uh, little rendezvous and and play yeah. some uh, and and play, get get our uh, setup on live and we'll we'll play something together because uh, heck yeah, it's just got to be back. after bedtime. Got to be after bedtime. Steal. That's the only time I play. I'm not a I'm not a during the day guy. Perfect. Well, I love it. Well, I mean, shoot, I I feel like this was a fantastic conversation, and uh, Jake, looking forward to seeing you at the the uh, Waste Management Phoenix Open. I know you're just thrilled and excited about playing that event, but also getting off to a great start on the PGA Tour. I mean, uh, just kind of last thoughts on what you're looking forward to the most uh, the rest of the year. Is there a, uh, one particular event, or just really, you know, continue to try to play well to to play get into some of these signature events? Yeah, I mean, I'd love to just really get into those signature events, obviously. Um, and there aren't too many events that I'm crazy looking forward to. I'm, I am looking forward to the Canadian Open. Um, my mom's from Canada, and so we always get some family that comes out for that event. And so um, that's a fun one that I've played that course before as well. So that'll be a good one to go back to. But yeah, I mean, ideally play well enough to, you know, maybe work my way into some majors. And, you know, for the most part, I've kind of stopped setting external goals and i just want to go and you know keep playing well get myself in contention and just try to play the best i can feel like every every week feel like i left everything out there no regrets so just gonna let it go well i look forward to following you out on the pga tour as i'm on the ground most weeks and looking forward to watching some of these bombs and if i feel like you're kind of lacking in the speed department i'm just gonna keep a protein shake in my back pocket when i follow you so when i'm out there and i hand you something say hey man like you need to eat your spinach like popeye and i'm gonna give it to you you just gotta you gotta take it and 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 eat it or or drink it and just be okay with it (laughs) deal i'll roll with it i can do that just give me a little (laughs) chirp and i'll get it going no problem i love it i love it (laughs) all right man well thank you for joining and looking forward to seeing you over in phoenix of course thank you smiley thanks for having me i'll see you guys soon absolutely I've actually watched a couple of episodes of, of, of y'all earlier, and uh, you guys have some good takes. So thanks for uh, thanks for what you guys do. It's cool to see what you guys are doing, and uh, I, I know golf fans appreciate it, but we we do too. So please keep it up. I think you're doing a tremendous job, and and you know I listen to this podcast; it's really cool. And-